All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and go back to Isaiah 41. Uh, second part of last week's preservation and what the Bible says about preservation. Does anybody need a sheet or everyone has their sheets? Because I have one sheet I can give away. All right, everyone's got their sheets. Okay, Isaiah 41, I'm just going to read, uh, you know what, we'll go ahead and read all 14 verses, 1 through 14. Uh, but the main emphasis is on verse 10. But Isaiah chapter 41 in verse 1 through 14, the Bible says, Keep silence before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together to judgment, who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword and as driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them and passed safely, even by the way that he had not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. The isles saw it and feared. The ends of the earth were afraid, drew near and came. They helped everyone his neighbor and everyone said to his brother, be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them, and shalt not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing, and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And let's go to the Lord in prayer again. Father, we ask that you bless our time. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Teach us what we need to learn tonight. Help us, Lord, to uh, keep what we learn tonight. I know the devil always wants to snatch away the seeds that you want to sow into our hearts. And, Father, sometimes we even aid in what the devil does by being distracted in our minds, thinking about other things. Father, we ask that you take away all distractions, allow our hearts to be ready, prepared to receive the truth of the seed of your word. I pray, Father, that you would... Teach the children in Kid Venture tonight. I pray their hearts would be tender to the truth of your word. Help them to learn uh, the message of the lesson and help them to have fun with the games that they'll have that they will partake in. Probably just ask that you would. Help us, Lord, to meditate on uh, what it truly means to be uh, preserved. Father, you're the one that preserves us. We don't preserve ourselves. We, we can't even protect ourselves adequately but Lord you do and we thank you for it thank you that Isaiah 41 10 can be truly one of our life verses a verse that we meditate upon every day a verse that we stand upon a verse that we use as part of our shield of faith holding up the word of God when the devil attacks and and saying nope my God is here my God will help me and protect me and guide me and father we thank you and praise you for it but Lord would you guide us through the lesson for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All throughout Scripture, there are examples of men and women who the Lord preserved. You think about the nation of Israel. The only reason why Israel is a nation even today is because of their God. God is the one that created Israel by calling out uh, Jacob and changing his name later on to Israel and his 12 sons. Uh, being the 12 tribes of Israel, God has established Israel. And though the enemies of Israel want to wipe Israel off of the face of the earth, they cannot and will never do it because God preserves Israel. 
Now, God does allow some hardships to come into the lives of God's people. We th see it throughout Scripture where God allowed Jacob and his family to move down into Egypt. Once Joseph was there, second in command, God provided for Joseph, preserved the life of Joseph. God preserved the nation of Israel, though they were 430 years in slavery in Egypt, yet God's the one that preserved them, brought them out with a mighty hand. You even go back to Noah. God preserved the life of Noah uh, in the days that the ark was being built and the day that God flooded this earth. Noah and his family, eight souls were the only ones saved on that ark besides the animals that were there. The life of David was preserved by God. Uh, Jeremiah's life was preserved by God. As Jeremiah was a prophet of the Lord. He's, he is called the weeping prophet. Nobody would listen to him. He would get himself thrown into the dungeon, into prison. Nobody wanted to hear what he had to say, but yet God preserved his life even though he was in a dungeon. And you think about the life of Job. God preserved the life of Job. And it goes on and on, Esther and Ruth and, and all of those that would put their faith and trust in God, God preserved their life. And we're talking about preservation and what the Bible teaches us about God's preservation in our life and even in his creation. Because God's power is seen all throughout creation and even in the preservation of what he has created. The world does not, as some believe, okay, God created it, but then God just left it to do whatever was going to happen. No, God has preserved this planet, preserved everything in it, and reminding us that preservation means protection, maintenance, care, safeguarding, and keeping. God has, I don't know how you want to describe it, but I don't know, divine preservation in your life. The only reason why you and I are sitting here tonight, of course I'm standing, is because of God. God preserved your life throughout today. And sometimes we don't think about that. You know, as we don't give God the credit that really is due unto his name, sometimes we think, well, you know what, I made it through another day. And we say, I made it through another day. And honestly, we're saying, praise the Lord, God has brought me through another day. God has helped me. And one thing I want to start with tonight, just to even remind us that God, his power is seen in his creation is even in the lives of animals. Now, animals do not have a soul. They're not going to go to heaven when they die. But there are animals there. You read about the lamb lying down with the lion. You think about the horses uh, that the Bible talks about. Uh, that when Jesus comes back and he is going to destroy the enemies of God and the armies of God are riding on those white horses, uh, that's us riding on those white horses coming back with the Lord. But I want you to look at Psalm 104. Because again, the word of God debunks or it, you know, whatever word you want to use, the word of God proves that there is no evolution. There is no Mother Earth. Nature does not keep itself going. Even the animals on this earth are preserved by the Lord. The Lord feeds them. Now, some of the things they eat, I would not eat. And some animals I would not eat. I've eaten some, some animals... Uh, a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, we, uh, we set out to, to taste some strange things. And I've had ostrich steak before, uh, grilled it right on my grill with my friend. We've had alligator tail, different things like that. Frog legs are probably one of my favorites. And I, always, I always tease Nathan because he's, he's a frog person. He, he, just, uh, he, he loves frogs. Not eating them, but I always tease them. You don't take care of it, I'm going to eat those frog legs. And he would make sure his tank was taken care of. But you know what? Just growing up in the South, I don't know, I like frog legs. All right? There's not a lot of meat on it, but they, it tastes like chicken. So you know what? If I'm, if I'm stuck on an island with frogs, I think I would survive. But when you look at Psalm 104, verses 21 through 28, again, just getting started uh, talking again about God preserving what he has created. Now I know, I know there's a timetable. We don't know the end of time, but we know that God takes care of it. Now God's not trapped in time like we are, but again, reminding us tonight as we kind of looked at last Wednesday, 
talking about preservation should help us to be reminded and to stand on the promises that, you know what, God preserves my life. If he saves me, he's not going to do what the Israelites thought, take me three days out in the wilderness and leave me and kill me, right? If God saved me, there's a purpose for it. And God's the one that takes care of us. Now, it doesn't mean we need to go and just eat everything we want to eat. All right, we still need to take care of the body that he's given us, but God is the one that is preserving. Psalm 104, look at verse 21. 21 to 28. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their meat from God. I mean, just the psalmist, right off the bat, he makes note that even the animals, they seek their food from their creator. The sun ariseth, they gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein, some sea creature. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. Again, God takes care of his creation. He takes care of the animal kingdom because he's given that life. God takes better care of his animals than most humans take care of their pets. Now, I do know of some people that take care of their pets better than they take care of their own kids. And that is a shame. But I want you to look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. Again, God takes care of what he has created. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. Jesus says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. So the Lord takes care of the birds. The birds are not out there like me, you know, tending to a garden. They're not like farmers that are going to, you know, fill up their barns and stuff. But God takes care of them. But listen to the last thing that Jesus says, Are ye not much better than they? We see preservation in God's creation with the animals. But he takes better care of you and me. And often we don't recognize it. Often we do not thank the Lord. Often people think they're preserving themselves, taking vitamins, uh, eating, you know, eating what's good for them, exercising. I mean, so many people are trying to preserve their life on what they do. But the best way to preserve our life is to walk with God because God gives us wisdom on how to take care of the body that he has created. One last place in reference to the animals. Look at Matthew chapter 10. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 10 and verse 29. Again, Jesus says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? Again, the Lord, he sees, he knows when animals perish, when they die. But again, you and I are far greater in value to the Lord. Yes, the Lord takes care of the animal kingdom. He continues to have this world spinning on its axis at the right degree, the appropriate amount of oxygen for us to breathe in. And yet he preserves our life. He preserves even our Christian life. But I want you to look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, because here's a question for us. If you look at question number 7 on your sheet, does God preserve our lives by giving us the necessities of life? Does God preserve our lives by giving us the necessities of life? And you already know the answer to that question is yes, but let's look at what the Bible says. Because God truly does give us exactly what we need to live. He's not always going to give us what we want, but he will always give us what we need. And we have to remind ourselves that God is always right in what he does for each and every one of us. 
In Philippians 4, you look at verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. What need do we have today? God can provide it because God's in the preservation business, preserving the life of his people. Is it a financial need? Is it a health need? Is it a spiritual need? An emotional need? Sometimes we think God is only interested in the spiritual. So if, it, if it's a physical, well, you know, God's not interested in that. No, God's interested in every aspect of our life because he's given us the life that we have. Again, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus, or in glory by Christ Jesus. Now look at Psalm 68. I mean, honestly, I mean, we could just stay in, in, in Philippians 4.19 and just talk about that for the rest of the hour because, again, I guarantee you there, there's probably not a single person in here who has not struggled at some point in their life with God not maybe providing something. Maybe it's not even directly something you need, but you indirectly, you're wanting God to provide for somebody else. Again, you think about a parent, you think about the father who came to Jesus. He didn't have a, a personal need, but he had a, a need for his son to be healed because his son was being cast into the fire, cast into the water. He was being, he, the, the devil was trying to destroy him. And the father said, I believe, but help my unbelief. I mean, he came to the Lord because somebody else had a need. You think about the four friends that brought their friend carried him on his couch, led him down through the, through the ceiling of that home where Jesus was in, and they brought the friend because the friend had a need. And they believed that Jesus could meet that need. Do we, you don't have to answer out loud, but think to yourself, do we honestly believe that God can supply any need? Can God fix something that's broken? And we would pretty quick say, well, you know. I mean, yeah, he can, but, you know, he probably wants me to call a plumber or, or whatever, you know. Because sometimes I've noticed in my own life, we think something's broke. It's usually, it's, it's, never, it's never me coming up with the idea. It's always my wife coming up with the idea and telling me, well, do this, do this, or have you thought about this? But there's been many times where we thought something was broke beyond repair, and then God gave the wisdom, oh, it's that, and we checked it, and it worked. And I only, I only say that is because, again, sometimes we think God's only interested in spiritual things in our life and not everything in our life, all right? And there are times, believe me, where God directs you to the correct repair man who's not going to rip you off and give you this astronomical bill and then not even fix, fix the problem, all right? Again, do we believe that God can supply every need that we have? Look at Psalm 68 and verse number 10, because this, I mean, this, is, this is preservation. This is what the Bible says. This is what God says. It's not just our spiritual life that he is preserving, but all of it. Again, the protection, the maintenance. I mean, we have a lot of maintenance in our life. The care, the safeguarding, and the keeping. But Psalm 68, in Psalm 68, look at verse number 10. Let me even Bama back up. Back up to verse number 7. O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness... The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. Thou... O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. As I'm reading this, I'm being reminded of the Israelites when they were in the wilderness 
and they had no food. And the Lord provided manna for them, angels food, bread from heaven. And every day God provided that manna that would sustain them. Every nutrient the body needed was provided in that manna. But what happened after a while? After a while of being provided that manna from God, the Bible says the people started loathing it. And they got tired of it. I mean, who likes to eat, you know, barbecue chicken for lunch and breakfast and dinner every day? Probably Emily, because Emily is a big barbecue sauce person. But, you know, the body, we tend to kind of, eh, you know, I've had it for five days in a row. I want something different. But God provided exactly what they needed, but the people lusted after something. You know, we want something different. You know, we're tired of eating this manna. We want some, we want some meat. And I'm a, I'm a big meat eater. I like meat. And these God's people wanted meat, so God sent them a quail. I wonder if there were those that believed that, you know, there's no way that God can provide. Okay, okay, he rained manna from heaven. But quail, can he really provide enough quail for thousands of Israelites? And yet he did, because the Bible records that he did. But what happened when the fattest of them had the quail meat in their teeth? The Bible says he killed them. He choked them on the meat because they were desiring something other than what God was providing. Again, God can provide anything and he can, he can do it in a great way. You think about, you know what, you think about just the Israelites needing to escape the Egyptians. What an awesome day it was when they all walked out of Egypt and didn't just walk out, but they walked out, as the Bible says, spoiling the Egyptians. Egyptians just gave them whatever they wanted. I mean, clothes, I mean, jewels, I mean, gold, whatever, just get out of here. But then they find themselves entrapped at the Red Sea. And many of them thought God was just a cruel joker. Because they started complaining to Moses that, again, God has brought us here. I mean, we can't cross the Red Sea. There's a mountain on the left. There's a mountain on the right. The Egyptian army is coming right behind us. What kind of sick joke is this from God? We don't say that, but often God's people have that thinking, why is God doing this? Why doesn't God just provide what I need without me asking for it? I mean, if God knows everything, he should just, you know, have everything lined up and I never have to ask a word. But then we would never learn to trust the Lord. We would never learn that God truly is in control and God truly is preserving my life. Look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We get so used to things just even working out at times that we forget about God. We know he's there, and we'd say, oh, I'd never forget about God. We forget that God is the one that truly provides. I mean, let's be honest. When was the last time we, and I say we, when was the last time we prayed that God would provide food for the family? Now, kids might be praying, oh, Lord, I, I hope my parents come home with some good snacks, Right? But well, honestly, when was the last time you and I seriously had to pray because we had no food anywhere in the house and no means of going and buying the food? Again, I bring him up quite often, but George Mueller is, is someone that really, I mean, he knew what it was like to not have any money as he took care of orphanages or orphans and had to pray in the food for every meal. I mean, we go to our cupboards, we go to our refrigerator, we have money in the bank to go get what we need. And that's, I think that's a danger. I mean, it's a blessing. We can say the Lord truly is blessed. I never, I never go hungry. And even David said that. He's never seen the righteous begging for bread. God's always provided. But let's not get to the place where we forget to even thank the Lord for what we have and the ability to be able to go and, 
and get what we need. God truly has blessed his people. In James chapter 4, look at verse 13 through 15. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 15. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. You understand what the Bible is saying there. There are those that just, you know, I'll, I'll just do what I want to do, no big deal. I did it yesterday, I'll do it today, I'll do it tomorrow. And God says the mindset should really be, if the Lord allows me to, then this will work out. Because God's the one that's in control. For that we ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live or do this or do that. Understand, I mean, we're reminding Hebrews that there is an appointment. We all have an appointment with death. If the Lord tarries and we all die of natural causes or be in an accident or whatever, we know that the time is correct. I mean, there, there's an appointment. It's a point on the man wants to die after this, the judgment. God's the one that preserves our life. We see that in the life of Job. I'm sure Job thought his life was going to end. I mean, he lost everything. He has the boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. You think about even uh, Jonah in the well's belly. He thought he was done for. I mean, I would think so too. I mean, you know, being swallowed by a well. But then after three days and three nights, Jonah realizes, man, God really is in control. I better pray. Uh, Lord, you're, you want to give me a second chance? And God gave him a second chance. He still didn't have the right heart about going to Nineveh. But even Jonah learned God's the one that decides when that life is done. God's the one that's in control. When you look at the scriptures here, and even that verse 14, or verse 15. If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Our mindset, as we think about God's preservation in our life, our daily mindset should be, Lord, have your way with me today. Guide me according to your will. Help me to know how to walk in the center of your will today. And just allow God to truly show himself great and mighty in your life and my life. When you look at question number eight, does God really preserve even the Christian life? You look at Philippians chapter two, does God really preserve the Christian life? Philippians chapter 2, you look at verse 13. You know, let's even back up as Paul writes to the believers at Philippi. Look at verse number 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Paul obviously gives glory to God that his life has been preserved. Paul thought he was in control of his life before he met Christ on the road to Damascus. He thought he was in control. I mean, he had the power from the religious rulers to go and haul Christians back to jail, to persecute them. He's even the one that consented to the death of Stephen. He's the one that the mob looked at and he basically gave the nod head or, or whatever. He, he told them, take him, kill him. He thought he was in control until he met Christ and realized there was someone greater than him. There's someone who has all power. There's someone who kept Paul alive for him to meet Christ on the road to Damascus. Because after he converted, 
after he was born again and put his faith in Jesus Christ and denounced everything else he was trusting in, his own peers tried to kill him. They waited at the gate, wanted to kill him because he had turned on them. And yet God preserved his life until the appointed time when he laid down his life, when he gave his life there in prison in Rome. And he writes that final letter to Timothy, encouraging Timothy in his faith. I mean, really, when you look at the life of Paul, you can see Paul's life as the average life of a Christian, going through difficulties, having to rely on God more and more every day, having people against you, having the devil after you, all the things that Paul endured, yet God's the one that preserved his life. Again, in verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Look at Psalm chapter 4. We'll do a couple of Psalms here. Psalm chapter 4. Psalm chapter 4, verse 8, we'll go to chapter 63 and chapter 121 in a moment, but Psalm chapter 4 and verse number 8. The Bible says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. So God's the one that does protect us. God's the one that keeps that safe hedge of protection around us. And even the life of Job reminds us that when the devil comes to God and tempts God to touch the life of Job and take away his stuff, and God says, he's in your hand, and the devil says, you have a hedge of protection around him. Even the devil recognizes Job's life was blessed by God. God had a hedge of protection around him, and the devil couldn't do anything unless God said, okay, I'll take the hedge of protection down, but you can't touch his life. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to remind us because when we're looking at reality, when we're looking at life, sometimes the mind forgets. But the heart should never forget. The heart should have God's word richly dwelling in it that we're always reminded, my life is in the palm of God's hand. Look at chapter 63 of Psalm. Psalm 63 and verse number 8. Psalm 63 and verse number 8, the psalmist says, My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me. Thy right hand upholdeth me. Go to chapter 121. 121 and verse number 3. We'll even start at verse number 1. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Aren't you glad that God never sleeps? God is always on call. God's always there. I love the fact that he's watching over us and already knows when we need help and waits for us to call unto him. But as I brought up Job a minute ago, I want us to, to think about something. Look at number nine. Because sometimes people think the devil just has, you know, free reign to do whatever he wants. And he does it in the life of God's people. But does God determine how far Satan may go in opposing God's people? Again, when you look at Job chapter 1 and verse 12. We'll look at some other verses as well, but Job chapter 1, verse 12. Does God determine how far Satan may go in opposing God's people, or does the devil just do whatever he wants? I hate to say it, but some Christians do think the devil can just do whatever he wants in their own life. Now, before I even read this in Job... It is kind of up to you and me if we allow the devil to have room in our life. If we open up the door to things that are not right, things that are contrary to God, well, then we're inviting the devil in. We're giving the devil free access. But if we're not doing that, if we're living as Job was uprightly before the Lord, he eschewed evil, he feared God, and God mentions that testimony about Job and the devil says you have a hedge of protection around him. 
So the devil knows who is walking with God and who isn't because not that the devil knows everything. He, he's not omnipotent he doesn't, or omniscient. He doesn't know everything. He has to study people. He studies your life and my life to know our weaknesses, to know how to trip us up, to know how to get us off the straight and narrow path. He watches. When God even talks to him and asks him, where have you been? What have you been up to? He says, walking to and fro in the earth. Look at verse number 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. God tells the devil at this moment, all that Job has, it's in your power. Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And you know the rest of the account. He goes and he has... His children are killed, livestock's taken, servants are killed, but he allows one servant from, from each place to come and be able to tell Job. So Job, you know, will just get mounted up with the grief and the heartache of, of what's going on in the day. But listen, this is something we have to constantly remind ourselves as God's people. God's the one that says, all that he hath is in thy power. But back up. In verse number 9, Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Verse 10, Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. The devil took knowledge of Job. He took knowledge into what he couldn't just do whatever he wanted in Job's life. God had a hedge of protection. A lot of God's people fear the devil and fear that the devil can just do whatever he wants. But he can't. The only thing the devil can do is what we allow him to do and what God allows him to do. And if God allows him to do it, our first response should be exactly what Job's first response was. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Job responded correctly at the beginning of his trial. Job had the right heart and the right mindset that everything he had, it was from God anyway. But that's not the way that we, and I say we just as Christians in general, that's not the way we often think. Because we think about, well, I worked hard for that. I paid for that. I struggled for that. I prayed for it. I mean, I did all of this and now it's gone. Forgetting that God's the one that gives it. And if God thinks it's necessary to take it away from us, then we have to trust him because he's the one preserving our life. He's the one that's guiding our steps through this life. He's the one that has the ultimate purpose for our life. Look at Psalm 124. Psalm 124. Psalm 124, verses uh, 1 to 3. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, when their wrath was kindled against us. Again, David recognizes in this psalm that it was only God that preserved the nation of Israel and preserved his people. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Now, each of us could say as God's people, if it had not been the Lord who was on my side, this, this, and this would have happened. But again, God is the one that is in control. Why do so many of God's people walk away from him? Why do so many people stop going to church, stop reading their Bible, stop praying, stop trusting God, and start doing things that are contrary, contrary to the truth of God's word? 
Because they stop believing God's in control. Why is it such a struggle for people to just do what's right according to God's word? Because then that means we have to submit to the authority that he has over us. That means we have to admit when we're wrong, and nobody likes to admit when they're wrong. The devil has convinced many of God's people that God is not interested in anything but the spiritual. He's not interested in, in what you eat. He's not interested in where you live, what you watch, what you listen to. He's just interested in the fact that you're saved or are not saved. And that's just not the case. Look at Psalm 107 because we run out of time. We're just going to zoom through these real quick. Question number 10, are we as God's people authorized to cry unto the Lord when in danger? If God's preserving my life, then can I cry out to him for help? And we went over prayer uh, a few weeks back, but remind us again, again, this preservation. I wonder, I wonder if Noah stopped praying. I wonder if Joseph stopped praying when he was in prison when he found himself being sold into slavery. No, because the Bible says that in Joseph's life, everything he did, others recognized the hand of God was with him. The only reason why Joseph was able to endure what he endured was to have a right attitude. Being able to think, okay, God's in control. And remember, he even tells his brothers later on, you meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And having that right mindset and that heart that is fixed upon who God is will help us to have that right outlook on life that God always means it for good. God's always looking after our best interest. God is truly involved in our life. In verse 23 of Psalm 107, Reminding us that God does give us. You know what? Even if you don't, before I read this, even if, even if you don't like what's going on in your life, you don't like what God's doing, you know, you can go to God and, and obviously with a humble heart, not with arrogancy or pride, but with a humble heart, Lord, I don't understand. I'm not liking this. I fully trust you. Help me to see what I'm supposed to see and help me just to be in the center of your will and to be resolved like, like Daniel was to just be where you have me to be, all right? Because Daniel was in a place he didn't choose to be. He did not commit any sin in his life to be taken to Babylon, but obviously sin affects others, and the sin of Israel affected everybody at that time. In verse 23, the Bible says, They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep, for he commandeth and it raised and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. He's talking about the men on the ships. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Have you ever found yourself at your wit's end in your life or at some trial? Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. I'm glad that when we find ourselves distressed with life, we can cry out to the Lord, and he brings us out of that distress. He may not necessarily calm the storm, but he brings us out, putting calmness in our hearts, helping our focus to get back on him, unto the one that our help comes from. Look at, um, look at Psalm 116. Question number 11. Has God promised to answer the prayers of his people? He's given us the authority to pray. Has he promised to answer our prayers? And you already know the answer to it, but looking at scripture, 116, verse 1 through 8. Again, you and I have an adversary that's going to continue to try to convince you and me that God doesn't care. Even though we know he does, the devil still wants us to think God doesn't because something's not happening as quick as we want it to. 
God doesn't seem to be answering our prayer. Things don't seem to be changing. I don't feel like. Never go off of your emotions. We should never base any decisions off of our emotions. Because if Job did, if Joseph did, if Paul did. Think about Paul. Again, I think Paul is, is an example of the average Christian just living life, trying to do God's will. There's opposition at different times. What if Paul would have given up? Well, he wouldn't have been able to encourage Timothy or Titus. He wouldn't have been able to encourage others in their faith. He would not have been an example of someone who truly had a walk with God. He would not have been able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. So we all have a part in someone else's life to be able to encourage them as we walk with the Lord. And prayer is a big encouragement. Do we honestly believe in the power of prayer? Do we believe in the God of prayer? Again, I've, I've mentioned to people before to pray, well, I need something better than that. I need something that's really going to help. Okay, well, then you're never going to get any help as a, as a Christian, as someone who professes to be a child of God, if you don't believe that God answers prayer. Prayer is a big part and should be a big part of our life. It will help us to stay where we need to stay, and that's at the feet of the cross and at the feet of Christ. Psalm 116, you look at verse 1, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. What a wonderful truth that is, that we should do that, call upon him as long as we live. But just stopping, looking back at verse 1 in the first four words, I love the Lord. You know what will help us to keep moving forward in life? I love the Lord. And not because I love him because he didn't do anything for me. Let's be honest. You know what? He loved me first. Therefore, I love him. When you stop loving somebody, you stop doing things for them. You stop thinking about their best interest. God's never stopped loving you. He's never stopped thinking about your best interest. He has thoughts of peace towards you and me. He always thinks about us, and we as the psalmist should always be thinking about the Lord because we love him. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. The Lord truly has done great things for you and for me. We truly can see throughout the scriptures how God truly preserves our life. From the smallest detail to the most troubling trial that we find ourselves in. Look at uh, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 as we look at just the last question. Does God's preservation in our life encourage us to serve him? Does God's preservation in our life encourage us to serve him? Because truly when we recognize all that God does in our life, it doesn't matter what age we are. Some people have the, some young people have the mindset that, well, you know, church, the Bible, God, that's, that's for the old people. When I get old, then I'll, you know, start thinking about that. But no, I mean, no matter what age we are, if we call ourselves the children of God, a Christian, a Bible believer, a born-again believer, then we ought to have, again, the mindset that, you know what? Because God has done so much for me through Jesus Christ, then it is my duty 
to serve him with my life however he wants me to do that. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, God says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. One of the biggest deals in someone's life is their finances. We work for it. We scrounge for it. We save. We hide it. And yet God is the very one that gives us the wealth that we have. No matter what amount of wealth you have, it's still wealth because God's the one that's given it and we are to serve the Lord with what he's given us. Again, you go to the Old Testament and God judged his people for giving him crumbs, giving him the lame sheep. You read in the Old Testament, and, and I believe it's maybe in the book of Isaiah, where God talks to the people. Actually, you know what? It may even be in Malachi, where they were bringing God the lame sheep, the blind sheep, the sheep that were kind of marred in some way, and they were not giving their best to the Lord. Again, Malachi, it talks about tithes and offerings, but think about your life. Your life in general, everything about your life and my life, are we giving God our best or are we giving God what we don't want? Sometimes people think church is a charity. That God's house is a charity. God's ministry is a charity. And what I mean by that is they will sometimes give, give God what's broken that they don't want. In, in the years that I've been a pastor, not nobody in here, and I'm not trying to be offensive, I'm just trying to be real about how we think about serving God. If it's broken and you're not going to use it, don't give it to God. Well, I'm not giving it to God, I'm giving it to the church. Well, if it's broke, the church can't use it. But what am I, I going to do with a broken microwave that doesn't work? But the mindset is, well, you know, you can fix it, and then you can use it. And they don't think that they're giving it to God. They're just giving it to, you know, the church. They're giving it to, you know, the pastor. That's the wrong mindset because what we do for God matters. If I wouldn't use it, if I wouldn't keep it, why would I give it to God? Same with my life. My life belongs to the Lord. Everything I do in my life, I do it indirectly to God. You know why David said, look, David committed adultery and he committed murder. He didn't with his own bare hands kill Uriah, but he's the one that ordered his death. And God held him accountable for it. And when Job, or I'm sorry, when David gets things right with God, because God gave him a chance, because God's gracious and God sent the prophet to him to give him an opportunity to confess what he did, even though God already knew it. David was miserable. David writes Psalm 51, and in that psalm he says, To thee and thee only have I sinned. I've often thought about that and said, well, wait a minute. He sinned against Bathsheba because the Bible says that he sent for her and took her. Then he orders the death sentence of her husband. What does he mean he only sinned against God? When you think about it and you know Scripture and you read through Scripture, you understand he's not saying that he didn't do anything wrong to the other two people. But because he did do wrong to two people, he did it wrong to God. God gave David a prominent position he did not deserve. Who chose David to be the second king of Israel? God did. And God chose David when David had nothing to offer but his own faith in God. 
Because David shows his faith in God when he says to Goliath, I come to you in the name of the Lord. That's my defense. The God who saved me from a bear and a lion, the one who has preserved my life when faced with danger, God is the one that set David on that throne and preserved David's life through the years that King Saul wanted to kill him. So much so, King Saul comes within just a matter of feet to kill David. And God keeps that division. First in the cave of Adullam, when David's hiding in that cave and Saul just happens to come into that cave. Of all the caves that are out there in the wilderness, he comes to the one that David's hiding in. right? And, and David cuts off a hem of his, of his robe. A second time they're on a mountain and David's on one side and Saul and his men on the other side. And the Bible says that God kept a division between them. God preserved David's life. So it does matter how we serve the Lord. It does matter the mindset that we have. What does God want me to do with the life he's given me, with the finances, even with the material possessions? Because God has preserved us for a reason. And our mindset needs to be a biblical mindset that, you know what? I'm going to trust the Lord with everything he's given me and I'm going to uphold the things of God as the dearest thing in my life. Look at last place I want you to look, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 through 29. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now Paul talks about, as he writes to believers at Colossae, this verse 29, he talks about the work that God's doing in him, which worketh in me mightily, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Who is it that even gives us the will to even do what's right? It's God. And then he helps us to fulfill that will, to do what is right. So as you think about it, and let me encourage you, uh, don't just, you know, take, take this and, and just talk, okay, we're done Wednesday nights. Go back over it and think about it. Meditate on it. Because listen, I remember, and I know because there's a couple teenagers in here, and I want you to think about this. I remember being a teenager thinking, you know, meh. when I'm 80, I'll think about God. God didn't let me wait till I was 80 to think about him. God allowed my dear brother-in-law, who was like a brother to me, die. I was in my early 20s. Well, I don't know, 21? I don't remember, 21, and he was 28? Because he, as a young person, I had the thought, you know, oh, I got years to think about it. I'd ne I had never known anyone personally that died at such a young age. But when that happened, that got my attention. I realized, oh, life is short. Now, there's a reason for this life. Because at that moment in my life, I realized the only reason why I was alive at that moment was because of God. I had had some near-death experiences as a teenager because of stupidity because of foolishness, I realized, wow, God truly is in control. It doesn't matter what age. I'm 49 now, and I'm still reminded God's in control. 
I can choose to do what I want to do, but it may not work out. But you know what? I'm thankful that there's a God in heaven that watches over me, that knows me by my name, has a purpose for every day I wake up to. And my purpose is not to tell somebody else. Now, as a pastor, it's a little different, but as a, just as a personal Christian, my job is not to go around pointing out the speck in everybody else's eye while there's a beam in my eye or to point out things that, you know, I just don't like. I wouldn't do it that way. No. Our purpose every day is to find out God what would you have me do today? Because I know there's a purpose for today. I know you've preserved my life until this moment for a reason. How can I fulfill your will right now? That's the mindset that we are to have. Every day that we wake up is not by chance. Have you ever thought about when you lay down in your bed at night, I may not wake up in the morning? I never thought about that as a young person. And really, as, even as in my 30s and early 40s, I probably never really thought about that either. But realize, you know what? God already knows the time that he's going to take you home. Now I would love for it to be me standing right here. You know, Enoch was walking with God, and just all of a sudden, you know, he's not on this earth anymore. I would love for me to be staying behind this pulpit and, and go straight up, all right? But only God knows that. He only knows the time. What I'm just trying to say as we close this message, don't lose sight of your God. Don't lose heart with your God. Continue, no matter what your age is, continue to work on your relationship with God. Continue to hide God's word in your heart. Meditate on God's word. Never get to a place where you think you don't need to grow spiritually anymore. You don't need to listen to God anymore. You've learned enough. Never get to that place. Continue to learn, continue to grow, and to continue to meditate on the fact that God is over your life. We may not like everything in our life, but God is there to guide us through it.